fancy um, flex-driven custom presentation software. I'm going to do this ghetto. So um, I've, I've decided to throw away my talk a couple of days ago and go with something completely new and explain why as I go along. I'm quite glad I did because a lot of the topics I was going to cover, it turns out um, Christian and Stuart have, have been over in, in enough detail that I think you'll get the gist of it. You don't really need me to um, spend 45 minutes talking about them. And so this talk is about beating server-side developers to the growth of game. Now, it's quite clear that there has never been a better time to be a JavaScript developer, to be working in client side code, to be doing stuff. And I think all of the talks today have really helped demonstrate that. Um, there's an enormous amount of potential in the new stuff that's coming through in HTML5. The browsers have never been more fantastic. We're finally out of that sort of four years of stagnation where none of the browsers seem to evolve at all. And um, it's generally a really exciting time to be doing stuff um, with the client. And if anyone was paying attention yesterday, um, this happened. This is uh, Google's Chrome OS, which they just announced yesterday afternoon. And Chrome OS is, it's interesting because it's for, the, for the first time in a year, somebody's actually re decided to rethink the operating system as a whole. With Chrome OS, you turn your computer on and it goes straight into a browser, there is no other operating system. And every single application that you run is a browser-based application. I don't know if you can see it, but up here, this is um, one of the nicest things about Chrome OS. They have these little application tabs. So you can promote a web application that you use frequently, like mail or calendar, into a little tab that's always there. Other things they've got are these panels, so applications can have sort of persistent presence on your desktop and you've Chrome in this window. And um, what's really interesting about Chrome OS is it's, in, it's, it's contrasting to the iPhone. When the iPhone came out a few years ago, Apple said, hey developers, this is fantastic, you can make, web, you can make applications to the iPhone using HTML and JavaScript the mobile Safari. And the developer community said, yeah, but, but you guys get to do it with like, low-level code, and you, you get to build native applications and do cool stuff. And that's, that's kind of unfair. And of course, a year later, Apple said, oh, actually, you know, we were just kidding about that whole extra thing. Here's, here's the um, development kit for you. Um, Google has stated that they're not going to do that. With Google Chrome, the applications that Google write are going to be exact, uh, of the same space as Apple's applications that anyone else is writing. These are just HTML5, they're JavaScript, they're various other bits of offline storage and all of that kind of stuff. And it's going to be a level playing field. And best of all, there's no app store approval. An application is a URL, so anyone can put them up on the web. It's the sort of open, open development platform, provided you don't actually try and you know, hack the BIOS or anything, that, um, that, we've all, that we know and love from the web. But there's a problem. And that, so you guys are client site developers. Um, and the world looks fantastic and rosy, and there's um, an enormous opportunity in front of you. And in fact, uh, I'd say that client-side development, development is probably the most marketable technology, technology skill out there at the moment. If you're a, if you're a server side specialist, if you work, work in Java or PHP or Python, then you're limited in your jobs to companies that use Java or PHP or Python. But if you're a client-side developer, especially if you're a JavaScript expert, every, every company doing development out there needs your skills. You're extremely marketable. So, I, so the problem then is, uh, to be honest, the problem then is people like me. I'm a server-side developer. I'm wearing my crown Django Pony t-shirt with the golden trim on it. Um, and server-side pro programmers, I'm sure people have noticed it, have something of an attitude problem. Is there anyone in this room who's ever felt that server-side developers look down on their chosen area? Anyone who's ever got that sort of vibe of superiority from server-side developers? But it's, it's not, it's server side, client side, it's kind of west side, east side, because you guys just aren't getting enough respect. Before anyone complains, you get not getting enough respect, sorry. Before anyone complains about that, I should point out as a white middle class English Guardian reader who's watched every episode of one, my gangster credentials are completely impeccable. <laughs> um, so, obviously, um, this, is, this attitude problem has been going through a lot of, it's, it's sort of a, a, an ingrained thing. One of the things I use to try and explain why this is a, a ridiculous sort of state to be in, um, is this little, this little example here. This is a paper from Wikipedia about polyglots. And the polyglot is a computer science joke. Um, if you scroll down, you'll see that the polyglot is a program written in several different languages at once. That's, this program here is equally valid C, PHP, and Bash. So if you run it through C, it'll say hello world. If you run it through PHP, it'll say hello world. If you run it through Bash, it'll say hello world. And it works by this unholy trickery of comments hiding out bits of code. So the C comments hide the PHP, the PHP comments hide everything else. If you think that one's good, if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, there's a link to a polyglot in 15 different languages. 
this is a this thing is a real this is a real work of beauty. It's got ZSA at Bash, C plus plus C. Down here it's got Rainfuck, which is a delicious <laughs> <laughs> um, It's actually called Rainfuck, I'm not making it up. And best of all, the um, the white space there is a program known called White Space, which treats every visible character as a comment, and the code itself is encoded in spaces and tabs that you can't actually see. Which is it's fantastic stuff. But of course, if you're a client side developer, this isn't really so much a joke because this is what you do every day. You're writing code which has to work in eight different rendering engines, all with their own design that works. And we've all seen the kind of hacks that, that people have had to use to, to get stuff to work. So we've got a program which is supposed to be this ultra sort of uh, ultra geeky trick that people pull off to show off. That's something client side developers do every day. And I don't think a lot of I, I think most service side developers where they have one platform and one set of code, and if it works on the server, then they're finished and they can go home. And I don't think they really appreciate the um, level of ingenuity and engineering that goes into the client side. So, the question then is, what are you going to do? What are you going to do about it, right? You've got these server side developers who are marching around dissing you, and, um, <laughs> can't believe I'm trying to pull that one up. Um, <laughs> and, and you've got, and you're armed with a fantastic array of client side tools, but, um, is there a way of cutting the server side developers out of the loop? Can you, um, can you, uh, I'm not try. Uh, can you, um, can you support their stash? Or, um, otherwise, otherwise mess with their business. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that you can. Um, using your client, client side skills that you have today, you can build, you can, you can basically cut, you can cut server side developers entirely out of your, out, out of, out of the industry. And in fact, using the tool I'm going to show you, you can run circles around them. You can do what they do, but better. And um, some of the techniques we've already seen, I mean, um, Christian talked about this a little bit, um, JSONP and these JSON web APIs, um, something which didn't exist four years ago, and now means that from it, with a little bit of JavaScript, um, a bit of client-side code, and a god-awful filthy security vulnerability hack thing, you can pull data from other services and you mix it together. Um, Remy's thing here, which since I haven't got internet is showing a few broken images, is a great example of view source on this. It's all JavaScript. It's hitting the Twitter search API using JSONP. It's pulling things together. It's, it's mining that data and it's spitting it back out on the page. Another example is this site here. This is tweetersation.com. This is something that um, Matt and Dan and I put together. And the idea with this is we were trying to solve that problem on Twitter where, you're, where someone you're following is having a conversation with someone who you're not following. And you only see one half of it and you have no idea what's going on. So Tweetersation lets you load, type in someone's Twitter name, puts them on the timeline, and then you can load other people together. You can create a sort of custom timeline just for the purposes of dissecting their conversation. And again, Tweetersation, there's no server-side code at all. It's about 300 lines of JavaScript. The code's all up on GitHub if you want to take a look at it. And it's a brilliant, and it was fantastic from our point of view because it was a zero-hassle project. We knocked it out in an afternoon. We stuck it up on whatever web host, I can't even remember, and it was live, and we never, have, we don't have to worry about managing a server, or having a database, or having to log in and fix things, or any of that crap, which is really, really good news. Again, as a server-side developer, this, that, all of that kind of crap is sort of my day job, but, but there you have it. So, all of this stuff is brilliant, and fantastic, and I bet you can guess what I'm going to say next. Um, it's also, it's, it's bad for the web, right? Well, it's not bad for the web. This, if you're doing this kind of thing for prototyping and for mixing in non-essential bits of data and so on, it's, it's fantastic. But there's this really worrying trend over the past couple of years of people just be, of people dropping the old unobtrusive JavaScript principles and saying, you know what, JavaScript's everywhere, it's inevitable. We'll build stuff which not only doesn't work without JavaScript, which fundamentally relies on JavaScript's existence for it to do anything at all. And bizarrely, Google is some of the worst offenders here. I'm sure everyone is aware of the Google Web Toolkit, which takes the quite frankly bizarre approach of, to, of, of allowing people to write JavaScript in Java, which to me feels a bit like trading in your bicycle that you used to go to the shops with tank. You know, these things are, it's, it's relevant in some circumstances, but it's not exactly the perfect tool for every job. And the problem with GWT is that Google are now building stuff with it, um, like Google Moderator. Um, which really shouldn't be done relying on JavaScript. Google Moderator is essentially a sort of forum thing, right? It's um, a thing where you can post questions and, uh, and, and vote them up and, and sort of vote on what should be there. This is content, this is not an application. And yet if you do source on this site, you get a whopping huge chunk of JavaScript, 
and a strip tag and a no strip tag telling you to sod off. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> and it's essentially bizarre seeing this from Google because of course they're a search engine. They can't index this stuff. Um, or at least you thought they couldn't. Then a few months ago, um, the GWT team actually put out a proposal for a way of making their, of making JavaScript-only websites indexable by Google, which I think they were recommending you run the browser on your server as a sort of headless interpreter and, and output static HTML just for the Google bot and do dynamic HTML for everything else. It was just a just an ungodly nightmare. Um, so, not a huge fan. Then there are things like Cappuccino, which um, at least Cappuccino really does focus on the application side of things, not the content side of things. But to be honest, this for me doesn't really come down to, it's, for me this comes down to a sort of principle of, of, of the web that I love. I fell in love with the web which has URLs, and when you go to them you get stuff come back, you get pages of content. And this rush to, um, to, 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 to switch everything into, into JavaScript kind of makes me think that we're building this phantom web. We're building a new web on top of the old one that doesn't really exist and falls apart the moment you, you fail to bring your, your modern JavaScript, full-on full DOM implementation of JavaScript um, engine along to the party. So, now that I've kind of rained on the parade, um, what can you do as client-side developers? And I'm sure there are people in the audience who guess where I'm going with this. If you need, need server-side stuff for, for your, your stuff to be you know, useful, then what about doing JavaScript on the server-side? Um, Christian mentioned server-side JavaScript earlier. And server-side JavaScript is not a new idea by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Netscape, I think they released Netscape 2, which was the first browser to have JavaScript in it, in 1995. <laughs> and they started doing server-side JavaScript in 1996. So one year later, they had Netscape, Net Netscape Enterprise Web Server, something rather, which had server-side JavaScript in there. And the idea keeps on coming back. People keep on trying to get it right. But if you look at most of the server-side JavaScript frameworks out there, basically what they've done is they've said, okay, well, PHP is popular, so let's do PHP, but we'll use JavaScript instead of PHP as a language. And so it's really back to document.write. It's just that your document.write happens on the server instead of the client. But it's all, it's, it's, it's deeply uninspiring. I'll look at these things and I'll think, well, I already know, I already know Python, I already know PHP, they work fine. Where's the server-side framework that takes what's unique about JavaScript and uses it to its advantage? And so, a week ago, my plan for this talk was to talk entirely about web APIs and how you can, how you can sort of bend the web to your will using, using security vulnerabilities and things. And then, um, two weeks ago, I came across this. This is, um, this is a new thing. This didn't exist five months ago. It's called Node, and it's yet another server-side JavaScript implementation, but this is, this actually fits the criteria I had. This is server-side JavaScript that looks at what's unique about JavaScript and says, okay, how can we make something using these characteristics that's fundamentally better than the way most server-side technologies work? Now, I'm genuinely really excited about this. I'm excited enough to have thrown away a talk three days ago just so I can, I can show you this thing. The problem is that explaining why I'm excited about it requires something of a dive into quite low-level, weird, asynchronous, event-based I.O. web server engineering details, which um, really aren't going to be much fun to explain. If you had trouble with the, um, the closures explanation earlier, and I've tried explaining closures myself, and it's an absolute nightmare, this is going to be even worse. Um, so with that in mind, I've decided to illustrate it with bunnies. Not just any bunnies, these are... Um, these are um, Apple iPhone emoji emoticons. The, yeah, this is, um, if you've got an iPhone and you haven't enabled emoji, you should totally do it, they're brilliant. It's the, um, it's, this is how Japanese school children communicate, uh, Japanese school girls communicate with each other. They don't use words, they use pictures of bunnies and rabbits and tigers, and Nat and I have been trying to, to figure out their language in our own text messaging, we haven't really got very far yet. So, imagine a web server. <laughs> a web server sits there on the web, and it waits for a browser to come along and talk to it, and it serves up a web page or a dynamic web page or whatever. And in this web server here, um, this web server is powered by a bunny. There's a bunny inside the web server that does all the work. So when a hamster comes along with his web browser, the hamster says to the bunny, give me the page, the bunny hands over the page, everything is good, and you've got a happy hamster. What happens, though, if you get several hamsters coming along? Well, if you've got a single threaded web server, um, then you've just got one bunny, you've got several hamsters, and the bunny has to deal out the pages as fast as it can, and the hamsters end up getting a little bit impatient. But for low traffic sites, it's not a problem. What about if you've got, how can you improve this? Well, obviously, you need more bunnies, right? It's a, it's a parallelism thing. So, this is how most modern web servers and web frameworks work. They have threads or processes, they basically have multiple bunnies. Each bunny knows how to serve the application, and if you've got five threads going, you can 
if you've got five bunnies, you can deal with five hamsters at once. And if more, more bunnies show up, well, it's still not a problem because the, 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 if more hamsters show up, the bunnies are going to get through them pretty quickly and get to the next one in the queue. But what this means is that every server-side framework out there, all of the popular ones, are optimized for serving up pages really, really fast. All of the work's done into making sure that those bunnies can turn around the page in a fraction of a second. So if you've got hamsters waiting, if you've got a queue of hamsters, it's okay, it'll only take a tenth of a second to get rid of those ones, and then you can serve the ones behind. And to be honest, this approach works very well, and it's how most of the web operates today. Where this breaks down, though, is if you want to do something a bit more interesting with your web application. If you want to, for example, go out and fetch a web API. So um, a classic example here, if you have an application which, just, which goes out and talks to Twitter, and then looks up a couple of things on the Flickr API, and maybe combines it with something else. And all of those background fetches are going to add up, and suddenly you've got a bunny who's taking two seconds. And that's fine until you get an influx of hamsters, and now there's hamsters waiting in the queue saying, hey, well, um, I want my page, it takes two seconds, but there's five hamsters behind it. So that poor hamster at the back is going to have to wait 10, 15, 20 seconds for the server to respond. You've got a lot of impatient hamsters, you've got a whole bunch of bunnies doing complicated things, and your site slows to a crawl. So as a server-side developer, um, these long-running processes, anything that takes time like that, is, it's really kryptonite to me. Um, and it's something that I will avoid doing at all costs, to the point of client side developers hey, say, hey, can we do this cool thing? I'll say, no, it'll, um, it'll seize up the server. Um, it's, it's, it's not worth doing. And actually, it turns out these things are really interesting. Like, obviously, there's web APIs and mashups and stuff, but um, later on, you get to things like Comet. And I know Stuart um, disparaged Comet as, as a disgusting hack earlier. I'm going to show you how, you how to do that disgusting hack in a moment. But the whole, whole thing with Comet is that you're trying to send events down to the browser live as soon as something happens, which means that the browser has to keep something open. And that means that you've got one of your bunnies held, holding on for sort of 10, 15, 20 seconds, waiting for something to happen. So that bunny can't serve any of the hamsters, the hamsters all snack up, you get impatient hamsters, and your web server melts in a flurry of fur, uh, I guess. <laughs> so what's the alternative? The alternative is the hyperactive squid. And there's, there's a reason I've gone with the squid here. Um, it turns out there's a much more effective way of programming things like web servers, programming anything where most of your time is spent on I.O. operations, waiting for a connection, waiting for an HTTP fetch to return, doing that kind of stuff. And that's to use an event loop, um, aka the hyperactive squid. So if I set the squid off, what the squid does is he runs up and down all of the hamsters at once, um, serve, serving, serving them a little bit at a time. So from the hamster's point of view, they get a bit of face time with the squid, and then a bit more face time a moment later, a bit more face time a moment later, and soon enough, they've had their request fulfilled. But the squid is never standing still. The squid never gets stuck waiting for three seconds for some web API to return. And this is, um, this is the event loop that Jake mentioned earlier with your browser. This is exactly what you get in your browser, where if you have a long running, um, if, if your browser gets stuck doing something, it can sort of seize up, because there's only one squid running around in your browser as well. Um, but using the event loop, using this hyperactive squid, you get happy hamsters again, so it's great. So the question then is, if there's this, um, this type of programming, this, it's called event loop programming, or asynchronous programming, or event driven, there's lots of different names for it. But the question there is, if it's so great, why don't people use it? Why, aren't, why, why, why do server-side developers still worry about making their pages return quickly and trying not to tie up all of their bunnies, aka threats? Um, well, the answer is the way that most languages encourage you to program. So, if, you're, if you want to do an event loop, the most important thing is that your squid shouldn't get stuck. If, you're, if he's running down serving, serving 100 different hamsters, and then he has to stop for three seconds to, to read a file or disk or to talk to a database, that freezes up the whole thing, and suddenly the whole server, server, server grinds to a halt, because you've only got one squid. So, bad code is code that looks like this. Um, and this, it could be Python or JavaScript, I think, it doesn't matter. But this is things like code where you say, fetch rows from the database, and wait until the database comes back to me and it's not the rows away. Or fetch a read a file off disk, even, even reading off disk can be a slow operation, um, and feed that back to the variable. Or go away and fetch this URL, do an HTTP request against whatever, get back a bunch of stuff and stick that in a variable. This, if you're doing if you're doing rabbit-based threaded code, this looks fine. Um, if you want to do event-based squid-driven programming, this is a total fiasco. So if only there was a language out there that actively encouraged people to think in a slightly different way. Maybe a language where you could very easily say, fetch this thing from the database, and when you're done, call my callback function. Or read this file off disk, and when you're done, call my callback. Fetch this URL, and call my callback function. 
And that's what, and this is stuff which most programmers don't really touch, but this is, this is how JavaScript works. This is what client side developers do every day. In the browser, you say, when the user clicks on this button, run this function. Run this AJAX request, and when it comes back, run this callback function. Set timeout, wait three seconds, and run my function after that. So JavaScript is, fun, is as a language, the very syntax of the language is designed for dealing with event-driven programming. And that's where Node comes in. So Node, if you look at the description, it's one, one sentence. It says, evented I.O. for V8 JavaScript. Evented I.O. means that this is a, it's an event loop, it's a squid. This is, um, this node is designed to, to do exactly what I've been talking about with the squid joke running up and down, but on the server side rather than the client side. And V8 JavaScript just means it's ferociously fast. It's using the same V8 engine that Google <coughs> developed for Chrome, which I believe is still by far the fastest JavaScript engine out there. So when you combine V8 hyperfast JavaScript with this evented IO squid concept, it means that you, and, and the fact that JavaScript is so well suited to doing callback event driven programming, you get something that's actually really interesting and really new. Um, and so I can show you that with a quick demo. I'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll fire up the simplest possible Node app. I'll fire up the Hello World. So this is what Node looks like. Just like in a browser, um, you have JavaScript and then you have the DOM. And the DOM is all of the sort of, sort of facilities that the browser offers you. Node, Node doesn't give you a DOM. Instead, it gives you a bunch of modules that allow you to do like useful server-side things, like create a web server, or do, a, do an HTTP request, or in some cases talk to a database. So here, all I'm doing is I'm importing a couple of modules using the common JS module system. I'm saying, create me an HTTP server, and that server, every time somebody visits a page on the web server, call my JavaScript function. And the function takes two arguments. It takes a request, which represents the data that came, from the, that came in from the browser, and a response, which you use to communicate back. If you think about it, this is basically the exact opposite of what you do in Ajax. With an Ajax request in client-side JavaScript, you're saying, um, here's, let's, we'll, we'll build a request object, and then we'll wait for the server, and, and we'll hand it off to the server, and then the server will give us back a response. Here, we're, here the request object has been built by the browser and passed to us, and, we're, and it's our responsibility to create that response that gets sent back. So for Hello World, it's very simple. We send a 200 status header, that's just um, distinguishing it from something like a 404. We send the body saying hello world, and then critically we call finish. And finish, that method there, is sort of the magic that makes Node so interesting to a hardened server-side developer like myself. And I'll create that server, I'll run it on port 8099. Once you've got Node installed, um, it comes as a command, Node, and you say node hello world.js, and it starts a little web server running on port 8099. This is going to be the most boring demo but there you go, that's um, Hello World in the ground. <laughs> but there is something quite interesting about this particular Hello World, and that's, um, and that's um, its performance. I'm going to run a tool called Apache Bench. Apache Bench is a benchmarking tool for JavaScript, uh, sorry, for web servers. And with Apache Bench, you can say things like, fetch this URL a thousand times and do it a hundred at a time. So I'm sending, basically sending an army of a hundred hamsters to hammer that server. Now, an awful lot of, this is actually quite a high setting. If you run this against a lot of um, regular server side frameworks, they get a bit upset because there's so much going on. If I run it against Node, it um, tells me to do 4,400 requests a second. Now, for comparison, I've got an Apache server running on the same machine, if I knock off the port, and the Apache server just, took, just served 1,500 requests a second. So for that level of concurrency, our noddy little JavaScript function is running faster than Apache, which is the sort of global Apache serving static files, which is written in optimized C, is sort of the global benchmark for, um, for web servers. So Node is really, really, really quick. Which, you, which honestly, if, you're, for, if, if you were talking about server-side JavaScript, performance would not be the first reason I'd go for for giving me the go. Um, but let's do something more interesting. Um, like I said, uh, Stuart set the stage for me very nicely. I'm going to show you a Comet server um, running in Node. Now, Node is ideally suited for Comet. Um, actually, no. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to show you uh, an interesting little thing you can do with Hello World. So, here's our Hello World server. I'm going to add a set timeout to it. I'm going to say it's going to do exactly the same thing, but it's going to stick in a two-second delay um, before responding. So if I save this, um, if I start up my... What's that? Uh, <coughs> ah, thank you. Yep. Um, okay, let's fire that server up again. And if we hit it in the browser, 
their listener thing like here is essentially if you're going to communicate a message to the sort of 20, the 20 different browsers that are all waiting for something to happen. So this is um, this is how uh, what I call this is how Django works. Um, you set up a bunch of URLs uh, like message form um, responds with the form, submit messages um, deals with the process form and so forth. And so really the main method here is dj.respond, which um, is really just uh, a wrapper around that sort of three lines of boilerplate I showed you earlier, where you write out the headers, you write out the body, and then you call finish. So the message form just responds with the message form, which is the generation I stored up there. Um, the submit messages thing extracts the post variables from the, um, from the, 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 the user's browser submitted and adds those as a message and responds with a thank you very much message. And then this is the interesting one. This is where the, this is the, this is where the comment stuff happens. So, if you notice in the demo earlier, the um, Firefox here is um, running Firefox, so you can see what's going on. You can see there I've got a wait um, command, which is sat there spinning, waiting for something interesting to happen. Um, and what will happen, that will either, after 10 seconds that will return, or after something happens that will return. So let's feed it a message. Um, there we go, so I just fed it a message, and that caused this thing here to return. And if you look at what came back, it was just a little chunk of JSON describing the new message that's been sent out by my server. Um, and this is how that wait URL works. Firstly, it figures out what ID has been passed in. If you say, I want messages that come in after ID equals three, and there are, and, um, there are already messages after that, it will just return straight away. It'll say, yep, there's stuff already, here it is, you should, you should hit me again for, to see what's new. Um, if there aren't any messages already, then it sets up that, that listener. And the listener is, just is um, very straightforward. It's that message queue object I created earlier. This time I'm adding a listener, so I'm saying when a message event comes in, call this function. And it's that function which calls the respond method, and the respond method calls finish on the on, on the request. So until and so the browser will hang until that event is fired, and that callback function executes. Um, when it does execute, I also remove the listener from the message queue because we don't need it, need it anymore, and I clear the timeout. The other part of this comment endpoint is this bit here, which says, after 10 seconds, even if there's no message, um, end the response anyway and get the user hit again. And you saw that behavior in Fiverr a moment ago. So I'll be pushing this code up onto GitHub directly after this talk. But it's, this is, um, so this is actually a relatively sophisticated example of a comment app. I mean, it's doing live broadcast of events to hundreds and potentially thousands of connected clients. And the comment code itself is less than 15 lines of code. And the reason it's so short is that um, it's using JavaScript as meant to be used. JavaScript as a language for dealing in events and callbacks. And Node is a framework which is all about events and callbacks. Um, there's an interesting philosophy that there's a, if you, if you look at the, um, some of the, the, the architecture notes around Node, uh, the guy who's writing it um, has a philosophy that Node will never have a blocking function called in it anywhere. So that problem I mentioned earlier where the squid gets, um, has one thing that it has to do when it has to wait, that's not allowed in Node. Which means that even if you're reading files off the file system in Node, you do it by saying, open this file, and once you've opened it, call my callback function. Um, Node ships with uh, non-blocking socket libraries, non-blocking HTTP. It's got a non-blocking DNS resolver in it, so if you want to do a DNS lookup on something, something which normally takes a fraction of a second, Node will still force you to do it in terms of do this lookup, and once it's over, call my callback function. And this all adds up to something which is not only extremely fast and extremely powerful, but a, a very natural fit for JavaScript developers. Um, I've got, now, there's, there's one, there, there is just one, there's, there's one problem remaining. So, you figure out Node, and it's easy because you know about based programming and all of that stuff, and so we'll just, we'll, we'll just assume that, that, that you've, um, you've got it all figured out. You show it to a server side developer, and they'll say, oh, well, that's very nice, but where's your database, right? What's the point of, of web applications if they can't actually store any data? And the good news is that, well, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is that Node isn't very good at talking to relational databases. Um, things like MySQL, it turns out, are actually very difficult to communicate with in an asynchronous way. Um, there's the beginnings of a library for Postgres to do that, but it's still very early days. The good news is that today you don't really need relational databases. Um, the past, sort of, the past um, 18 months have seen the meteoric rise of this new sort of philosophy of um, of, of web development and large system scale, so, um, called the NoSQL movement. 
And the NoSQL movement says, you know what, we've been using SQL relational databases for 20 years and they work just fine, so let's ditch them all and start from scratch. Um, which, as, as, as a sort of R&D type nerd, I think is, is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But seriously, though, the uh, NoSQL, it's, it's, it's like Ajax as well. Um, people have started fighting over what the acronym stands for. So if you listen to some people, it actually stands for not only SQLs. You're still allowed to use SQL databases, but you can expand your horizons a bit. But anyway, NoSQL databases, um, there's, there's dozens and dozens of them out there. Um, they have a couple of interesting uh, properties. Firstly, they tend to be pretty high performance because by throwing away some of the safeguards that you get in a SQL database, it turns out you can go a lot faster. And secondly, um, most of them, they, they tend to be an awful lot simpler. Learning all of the features in MySQL or Postgres or SQL Server can take years. I've been using various relational databases for the best part of a decade, and I still feel like I only understand a fraction of what they do. Whereas a lot of these NoSQL databases, they, there isn't that much to them. You can understand the model and you can get a pretty good idea for everything that it can do um, in, in not too much time. So there are two which I think are particularly interesting for Node, especially, um, they're also the only two that anyone's bothered writing an adapter for yet, really. Um, but those are CouchDB and Redis. Now, CouchDB I thought was worth talking about a little bit because this is another example of something where your existing JavaScript skills can be used for something completely unpredictable. <laughs> CouchDB is a document-oriented database queried and indexed in a map-reduced fashion using JavaScript with incremental replication, bi-direction conflict detection, all of these, these bizarre things. Basically, it's a JSON store. If you like JSON, um, if you like JSON objects, you can stick them in CouchDB and then you can write JavaScript functions that query it for you. And another nice thing about CouchDB is if you're running on a Mac, it comes in a really nice little installer package which gives you something that looks like this. This is a beautiful example of JavaScript as an application development um, language. So we've got this UI here managing our database, and it's, it's got all sorts of nice widgets, and you can configure things and replicate and set up replication, and all of, these, all of this stuff. That UI is written entirely in HTML and JavaScript. The Chrome around the edge is just a sort of packaged Mac thing to make it look, look more like a real application. But it is a real application. It's an application that's been written entirely in client side code. And it turns out that because CouchDB talks HTTP, it's just a web service, and that JavaScript and Ajax are very good at talking to web services, this is a very smart way of, of building a, um, an, an administrative tool against that database. So I've got a CouchDB database. I loaded in 2,000 tweets that I pulled from the Twitter API, mainly because tweets come preformed as JSON, so you can load them in very, very easily. And you can see that each tweet is um, it's a straightforward JSON object. You need to see it as JSON source code. It's got whether it's been favorited, text, created at source, all of that kind of stuff. And this is just loaded straight off the Twitter API. And then the way you query CouchDB is you write JavaScript functions. So I'm going to say I want to do a temporary view, and I'm going to write a query. And the query language is slightly, slightly weird, but um, you get used to it pretty quickly. I'm going to, going to write a query which says if dot dot text dot index of the word of the word al is greater than minus one emit that document i think you do it like this um, so i can run that and it'll take a few seconds because it has to go away and run that against every item in the database and it outputs all of my tweets which mention owls only this one mentions fish bowls um, <laughs> that one mentions another word with owl i'm sure there's stuff about owls in here somewhere um, Ah, there we go. Today's Saturday baby owl photo. And if I had an internet connection, I'd show you what it was. Um, so that's, that's, that's the, sort of the sort of slow way of querying things. But you can also hit save, and you can run that JavaScript function into the database, at which point CouchDB will up, constantly update its indexes and run that function against anything. Uh, it'll run that function against everything that comes through the database. And it'll, it'll be lightning fast, even though you're now writing queries in JavaScript as opposed to SQL or another language like that. So I've got a couple of them. Um, I've, got, I've got my owl view that I set up here. This is with a regular expression, so it really does just give me owl stuff. And you know, if you look at this thing down here, you can see that this, um, that query now has a URL. So I can hit it in my browser. I can say, I can hit this URL, and I now get that the JSON, of the, basically the Twitter JSON, echo back at me for all of the tweets which have the word L in there somewhere. And so I can build a node application against that, and that's exactly what I've done. If I run nodeowls.js um, and hit this page, uh, this is all of my L tweets rendered as an application. So that node now has a database. It has a CouchDB, a CouchDB instance running behind it that it can talk to. And you're now in a position where you're writing your server-side code in JavaScript, 
and your database queries in JavaScript, and the thing is ferociously fast. Um, in fact, I haven't tried Apache benching this, but I'll give it a go just to see what happens. Um, that's going pretty quickly. So that's doing, it's doing the database lookup and everything like that, and it's still running at about 230 requests a second, which is probably enough to, um, which is enough to, to handle most traffic spikes. And again, this is running on my laptop. So CatchDB is really good stuff. Um, the code for that one ends up being quite a bit more complicated. And that's because Node has quite a complicated idea of how you do HTTP calls. So you have to create an HTTP client for the localized web server, and then you have to create a request that is a get against that URL, and then you set you attach to the request's finish listener, saying, okay, well, once the request is in flight, I want you to run this function, and then that function um, adds a listener for body events, which is when some HTML, when, when something comes back from the API. You have to add those all together into a body string, you have to add another listener that listens to the complete event from that fetch, and then right down at the bottom, you call res.finish, which quite frankly is an absolute nightmare, and it took me, took me way too long to figure out how you do all of that. Thankfully, um, the Node community is already producing uh, uh, sort of libraries for, for making that kind of stuff go away. So this is an application rewritten to use the Node CouchDB library, and now you just say, hit my Couch, CouchDB, I want the Simon Tweets database, I want the owl view that I just created, and if it's retrieved successfully, give me the JSON loop for it, write out a bunch of list items, and then finish the request there. And if it fails for some reason, say error, and finish the request there. So, Making queries against something like CouchDB from Node uh, ends up being really easy. Uh, the other database that's worth looking at if you're interested in this stuff is one called Redis. Um, I don't have time to give you a demo of it, but Redis is much simpler than CouchDB and also much faster. It's basically a key value store. So you can say, store this piece of information, you call it Bob, and then later on you can say, get me back a piece of information that is stored as Bob. Redis is slightly more interesting than that because it also does list and set operations. So you can implement a web log in Redis by sticking each entry in its own key and then having a list somewhere that says, okay, my web, web log consists of these 500 entries in this order. And that would be enough to, um, to, to render pages very quickly. The other reason Redis is interesting is if you look at the benchmarks, um, MySQL is all the way down here, and Redis is this red line right up there doing 6,000, I think it does something like 80,000 reads or writes per second. So it's, it's very, very speedy, which is, which is rather good fun. So, the message here then is that if you want to not just try your hand to serve site development, but do it in an environment that is literally lines ahead of the state of the art for most other languages, Node plus something like CacheDB plus something like Redis is an incredibly powerful combination. And I'm personally really excited about this. I'm going to be using it for a lot of projects in the future. Um, there is, of course, one catch. If you're going to do this stuff, you don't need, you don't need a server site developer anymore, but you do need a sysadmin. So, uh, your Node, CouchDB, Redis, all of those things require you to have a service somewhere running those. So, it would be a very good idea to pay attention to this day, uh, system, system, system Administration Appreciation Day, July the 30th. And this is um, when you traditionally go and hug your sysadmin and thank them for nothing breaking. Because most of the time, if your sysadmin is any good, you never hear from them because everything just works. So, respect your sysadmins. And finally, um, just because this is, this is the reason. I, I decided to represent Node as a squid. I found this on the internet this morning. Um, this is what you can do to, to sort of mock your, mock your server side developers once you've made them completely obsolete. Do the dance. There we go. If anyone speaks Japanese,